Welcome, welcome. Um, Dr. Parker told me not to introduce him, but we're, we're going to do it anyway because, and then he told me he just won another award, so we definitely have to introduce him. <laughs> welcome um, to our second part of our series on Reconstruction. I'm Joanne Abel, the Humanities Program Coordinator, and we are really glad that all of you are here today. So I'm going to read you some different stuff about Dr. Parker than what I did last time. Um, he's a member of the Association for the Study of Afro-American History and the Organization of American Historians, the Southern Historical Society Association. He's a recipient of the UNC Board of Governors Excellence in Teaching Award and a member of Phi Alpha Theta History Honor Society and Phi Mu Gamma International Honor Society in the Social Science. And he just told me that he just won an award that is very dear to him. And it is the Christopher Critton Award for Lifelong Contribution in the Preservation of North Carolina History. So welcome with me, Dr. Freddy Parker. And real quick, we are going to try to hold our questions to the end except for clarifying questions. Is that OK? OK, Dr. Parker. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to sing a little bit. I believe I'll steal away to Jesus. Steal away. I believe I'll steal away to Jesus. Steal away. Oh, you know I ain't got a long to stay here. I ain't got a long to stay here. Ooh, ooh. I believe I'll steal away to Jesus. Steal away home. I believe I'll steal away to Jesus. Steal away home. You know I ain't got a long to stay here. I ain't got a long to stay here. Ooh, ooh. My Lord, he calls me. He calls me by the thunder. The trumpet sound within my soul. So, so you know I ain't got a long to stay here. I ain't got a long stay here ooh, ooh. and I believe I'll steal away to Jesus steal away oh I believe I'll steal away to Jesus steal away oh, you know I ain't got a long to stay here I ain't got a long to stay here. Woo, woo. All right. Yeah, I know that one, is. As always, it's, it's a good to be uh, with you. And uh, since we don't have but about an hour and a half, I want to go ahead and get right into our discussion for today. And, and what we'll do today is to look at basic reconstruction legislation that was passed by Congress between 1866 and 1875. Uh, understanding this legislation helps us to understand uh, a great, to a great extent where we are today. Because one of the important things about history, as I've told you before, it really doesn't make sense to study the past unless you can in some way show how it impacts today. It has to be uh, living. You know, I just don't think it's nice to talk about dead people un un unless you can allow dead people to help you understand where you are today. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're studying those who came uh, before us. Uh, I've done uh, over the past week uh, about three lectures on the civil rights movement in North Carolina. You know, this uh, year represents the 50th anniversary of the signing of that civil rights bill back in August 1964. 
and so the theme the national theme for african american history month is civil rights in america and so maybe before the year is over joanne we could possibly talk about doing a session on the civil rights movement in north carolina we hear about it on the national level but we probably don't understand the extent to which north carolina was really in the vanguard of the civil rights struggle uh, and, and a lot of times people like to put a date on it, 1954, 1930, but I, I take it all the way back to 1865, 1866. And, and that's when it began. Some would argue that it began before then, but it's, it's an ongoing struggle for civil and human rights for many groups of people uh, in this country and of course around the world. But uh, when we left uh, a month ago, uh, we, we had begun talking about uh, the Civil Rights Bill, but I really wanted you to see the language, the actual language of the Civil Rights Bill of 1866. Uh, Congress understood that it was important to pass the 13th Amendment because when slaves were freed in 1865, it was through an executive order. It wasn't even a piece of legislation affirmed by the Congress of the United States. So the idea was that since it was not codified into the Constitution that it could actually be, be overturned. So it was important to have the 13th Amendment. And Mr. Lincoln began pushing for the 13th Amendment uh, several months before he was assassinated. Uh, in 1866, you have this civil rights bill, and folks realize that you've given these people freedom, but you really have not put legislation in making them citizens of the United States and of the states in which they actually were born. So that's what this legislation was all about. In addition to doing that, you know, we, we talked about the black codes briefly in our last meeting. Uh, the Civil Rights Bill of 1866 was also designed to kill, to overturn those uh, repressive laws that were very similar to the slave code. So if you just look at the language, be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, that all persons born in the U.S. and not subject to any foreign power, excluding Indians not taxed, are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States and such citizens of every race and color without regard to any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude. And you can read this for yourself. You can go online and look at all of this stuff that we'll be talking about today. And uh, you can see the original language uh, and, and get an idea about how, in many cases, the legislators, leg legislators were intentionally vague and perhaps ambiguous about the way they wanted to put uh, those words into, uh, into a bill and, and eventually into a law. Now, when this bill was, was passed by Congress, Andrew Johnson vetoed the legislation. He vetoed the legislation for several reasons. Number one, he believed that if you allow these individuals who were just slaves yesterday to become citizens of the United States, the next thing you will do is to grant them the right to vote. So he actually used the word Africanize. He said you would actually Africanize the South with this legislation. And as we shall see, he used that term again in 1867. But he believed, of course, the blacks and whites could not coexist. He believed, of course, the blacks were innately and inherently inferior, and therefore they should not be given the right to citizenship. So I really don't know what he thought. If you're going to free people, then what should their status be? But he really never, never carried it to, to, the, to the next level. And, of course, Congress was able to overturn override that veto. And this is when the real showdown began between 
Andrew Johnson, the President and the Congress of the United States. And even when you look at the Congress of the United States, you have mostly Republicans, but always you have those who are moderates, those who are a little to the left, and those who are to the right. Uh, when Johnson began to do his little thing, some of those who were on the right began to move to the, the middle, and some of them even went to the radical side and were able to get much of the legislation that would be passed between 1866 and 1875. Now, Congress understood that this too was legislation. And the next Congress who came in <coughs> could do what? Actually overturn this legislation. So you want a constitutional amendment and that is why Congress began pushing for the 14th Amendment. And they passed the 14th Amendment on June 20th, 1866. And of course, it took two years for ratification to take place in July of 1868. And as we shall see, the, the southern states could not be readmitted uh, with legislation that was passed in 1867 until they did what? Ratify the 14th Amendment. And that brings us to the 14th Amendment. Uh, the language of the 14th Amendment, actually one of the longest amendments to the U.S. Constitution but you can see here that this is very, very important because actually when you look at Supreme Court decisions today, about 30% of all Supreme Court decisions today or since in the last 100 years or so have dealt specifically with the 14th Amendment. And as you read it, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So this did the same thing that the 1866 Civil Rights Bill did. But now you have it in an amendment. But this is the important, all of it's important, but this uh, next, these next few sentences are really important because this is the part of the 14th Amendment that's going to be used by the U.S. Supreme Court over the next 100 years or so. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. How often do you hear about the due process clause in American history? nor deny to any person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Uh, no state shall make or enforce any law was designed to overturn to kill those black codes which persisted. Which persisted, you know, you can pass a law without referring to it as a black code. They actually persisted. So this is a very, very important The showdown continued with, uh, with Mr. Johnson. He, he knows that he's, he's losing traction because what happened is he was spoiled. He had become spoiled because when uh, he assumed the presidency in April of 1865, uh, Congress not long thereafter kind of went into uh, seclusion. They went on vacation. And so he believed that he had the authority to control Reconstruction. And you, many of you may have heard what he did in the summer of 1865. He actually pardoned many of the former Confederates and allowed them kind of carte blanche to do essentially what they wanted to do. And uh, by December of 
December of 1865, Congress is getting all of the, this information that's coming in to Washington about what Mr. Johnson is doing. And so when they come back in January of 1866, they established this joint committee on reconstruction to really look at what was happening. And so they're actually having these sessions where they're bringing in former slaves and bringing in whites from the South to get a feel for what is happening down in the South. And it is then that they hear about uh, you know, uh, the, the tyranny that is actually uh, going on in the South. And so as we, as we roll around to 1866, Mr. Johnson actually goes on a campaign, goes across the country. This is the midterm elections in 1866. He's trying to ramp up as, 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 uh, as many votes as he possibly can for, uh, for the Democrats. And for the most part, it backfired on him because as he campaigned across the country, he talked about why you don't need the former slaves voting, why it is important to keep them at bay, to keep them separated from, from whites. And even some of the Democrats in the South said, this is just a little bit too ugly, Mr. Johnson. And so it backfired on him, and, and in 1866, it was a Republican landslide. And that, that brings us around to 1867 because what, what, what is going on is that there, is, there are these efforts on the part of Southerners to say, you're not going to come down here and do what you want to to us. So there was defiance on the part of Southerners. They're fighting. As a matter of fact, as we shall see, an organization called the Ku Klux Klan emerged in 1866 out in Pulaski, Tennessee. Not only the uh, Ku Klux Klan, but the Knights of White Camellia, based down in, uh, in, in, uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana. And a number of other organizations, the Rifle Association of South Carolina, the Rifle Association of Louisiana. And all of these, these organizations, for the most part, were bent on maintaining the status quo, to take us back <coughs> to pre 1865, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. By March of 1867, actually, of course, by January and February of 1867, Congress now with this, with this huge majority knows that they have the votes to do pretty much what they want to do in terms of controlling Reconstruction. Congress has decided that it is time for the Congress to control Reconstruction, not the President of the United States. So, on March 2nd, 1867, Congress passed what was called the Military Reconstruction Act, and it was entitled an act to provide for the more efficient government of the rebel states. All right? That says a whole lot in the, the title of the act. And of course, it was pa uh, passed on March 2nd, 1867. This is the first of four Reconstruction Acts that would be passed by Congress just in 1867. Wow. All right. Whereas no legal state governments or adequate protection for life or property now exists in the rebel states, of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, and Arkansas. And whereas it is necessary that peace and good order should be enforced in said states until loyal and Republican state governments can be legally established, therefore be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives that said rebel states shall be divided into military districts. And made subject to the military authority of the United States as herein, herein after prescribed. And for that purpose, Virginia shall constitute first district, North Carolina and South Carolina, the second district, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, the third district, Mississippi and Arkansas, the fourth, and Louisiana and Texas, the fifth district. So now those 10 Confederate states. Uh, are actually under military rule. If you 
know, under military rule, it means that you got to have some troops. And so thousands of troops are sent down into the south to ensure that the rights of people are protected. How many of you knew that the south had, had ever been under military rule? From 1867, actually, until 1877, for 10 years. Right. So what happens during these 10, 10 years? You have the troops there in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, where oftentimes where there is more violent activity, more defiance, you actually send more troops. Whenever the KKK is, is very, very strong, like in those 10 or 11 counties in, in South Carolina in, uh, in 1871 and 1872, you send more and more troops. And you even talk about doing some other things like suspending the writ of habeas corpus. And so this was a very, very important piece of legislation. Very important. But Congress was not through there. Under the first Reconstruction Act, the Southern states had to hold new constitutional conventions elected by universal manhood suffrage, which means that black males, 21 years of age and older, must have a right to vote for electors to these conventions. These conventions would then establish state government to ratify the 14th Amendment and guarantee black male suffrage. And once the provision, the provisional governments had fully complied with, with congressional directives, they might be allowed full status in the union, but Congress reserved the right to decide each case. And so as, as you see between June, 20, June 22nd and, and the 25th of 19, 1868, seven southern states were readmitted uh, by Congress to full status. Now, Mr. Johnson had, had uh, actually had, had a serious problem in his administration. And that was some of the individuals who were in his cabinet were loyal to the Republican Party. They were loyal to Mr. Lincoln. Some of them are still in his cabinet. One such individual was a man by the name of Edwin M. Stanton. Secretary of War. Secretary of War. Secretary of War. And as it turns out, he was a thorn in the side. He was a thorn in the side to a whole lot of people. At times, he was a thorn in the side to Abraham Lincoln. They had, they clashed. And it is believed that possibly he was a part of a plot to uh, actually kidnap Abraham Lincoln and hold him hostage because he believed that Mr. Lincoln didn't do enough to actually persecute Southerners. There's Southern no proof leadership. of that. Hmm? Is there no proof of that? No, 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 no real, no real proof. But there, there's some evidence, some breadcrumbs along the way. Yeah. Okay. So Congress, Congress understood the relationship between uh, Mr. Johnson and Edward M. Stanton. So as a part of the first Reconstruction Act, they decided to pass what, would, what was called the Tenure of Office Act. Now, all of you know that whenever the president nominates someone to the U.S. Supreme Court or to the cabinet, to his cabinet, then of course he has to get Senate confirmation. But the president does not need Senate confirmation to fire somebody in his cabinet. So Mr. Uh, president Obama wants to get rid of anybody in his cabinet right now. He does not have to go before the United States Senate. He had to go before the U.S. Senate to get that confirmation. All right? The Tenure of Office Act simply said, look, look uh, Mr. Johnson, you cannot get rid of anybody in your cabinet unless you get permission from us. See, when you're in the majority, you can do that, right? 
when you're in the majority, you can pass the kind of legislation that's been passed in Raleigh. <laughs> you know, when you're in the majority. Yeah. And in some cases, when you have a super majority, uh, it's what they, what they have. I mean, for example, in the United States Senate, in the U.S. Senate, in 1868, there were 45 Republican senators and nine Democrats. Wow. That's it. And at that time, there was no <laughs> need 60 people yeah. or, you know, to vote. That kind of, the rules have changed over the years. So Mr. Mr. Uh, Johnson is facing, you know, this barrage by the U.S. Congress in March of 1867. All right? So if, if Mr. Johnson gets rid of anybody in his cabinet, then he is in violation of congressional law, of, of a law. Even though he, of course, now he vetoed the legislation, right? <laughs> but what did Congress do? Overrode. Overrode. And this is what Mr. Johnson said that, you know, y'all want to Africanize the South. Uh, on that same day, they also passed what was called the Command of the Army Act. Now you know that the President of the United States is Commander in Chief until Congress somehow, some, Congress can somehow take that from him. And that's what they did. They usurped his power on March 2nd, 1867 by saying, look, uh, the President of, the, and by the way, the reason they passed this was because the troops are going to be sent to the South. Now, who can send troops anywhere? It's the President of the United States. So obviously, he was not going to follow the law and send troops to the South. So the man, the, the general in charge, in charge in Washington was Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant was a Republican. And of course, he sympathized with the Congress. So we'll make sure that the power to send troops will be bypassed, and now the general in charge in Washington will be the one who will be able to send those troops. And that's what the Tenure of Office Act did. It took the powers from the president of the, I know it might not make any sense, but if you have the power to do that, if you have the votes to do that, you got the votes to do that. If you have the United States Supreme Court uh, that says we're going to overturn the 1964 Civil Rights Bill and you have the votes to do that, then it's done. Students ask all the time, do you think it's possible that we could possibly go back to the days of segregation? Yes. <laughs> I mean, what happened with the 1965 Voting Rights Act just last year? I mean, who ever thought that would, that would happen? The fifth section of the, of the 1965 Voting Rights Act is now null and void. It's very, very important because uh, traditionally when, you know, when, when uh, uh, back 35, 40, 50, 60 years ago, uh, when folks did not want you to vote, sometimes they would actually change the polling place. Um, in addition to that, people, you know, the legislatures would gerrymander, they would draw lines based on who's in power. Who's in power right now in North Carolina? So you know essentially in what the next election is gonna look like. Yeah. Whoever's in power for the most part draws those lines to benefit them. So the fifth section of the uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, in effect said that if you're going to change your polling place, you have to let the Justice Department in Washington know you're going to do that. When you redraw your lines, it has to be sent to the Justice Department on, on several occasions in the last uh, 40 years. North Carolina's uh, redistricting package has been sent back to them to redo. Yeah. So now, those section, that section of the, uh, of the uh, 1965 Civil Rights Bill, uh, Voting Rights Bill is dead. Yeah. We'll have to see the impact that it will make over the next uh, few years. 
We understand the tenure of office act. You see what Congress is really doing now? Usurping the powers of the president. We will control Reconstruction. And then uh, they go on in, in July of 1867 to pass more legislation uh, to pretty much reinforce what uh, had been passed on March 2nd. When were they um, repealed, these two laws? The Tenure of Office Act and the, you know, I'm not sure exactly, 1872, I believe it was. For both these acts? Yes, oh yeah. Okay. No, they're not, they're, they're definitely not in place today. Yeah. Um, for some clarification, with the, the Tenure of Office Act, though, wasn't they, they knew what Johnson was going to do. Yes. And they, so it's good, we'll throw, we know he'll break the law, and that'll get us all the excuse we need to impeach him. Exactly. I mean, they knew that before they did that, right? Exactly. Okay. They did. Just want to make sure I we, we'll, we're going to get to that in just a okay. few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then what, what really upset uh, Congress was that Johnson went out in 1866 and said that the real Congress of the United States is not a real Congress. They're not, they're not, they're not real. Wow. And, you know, that really upset them. <laughs> and so actually that's in the language uh, of, of the impeachment articles. 11 articles of impeachment were drawn up and the fact that he had said this about us made its way into one of the articles of impeachment. Uh, the founding of the Ku Klux Klan uh, in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1866 uh, was, uh, I think many of us have heard and read about the Ku Klux Klan. It, it was uh, one of those organizations uh, that even though it may not have been founded exclusively to uh, do what it did within a few months, surely within a year of its existence, it, it, was, uh, it had begun killing uh, uh, blacks, or whites, anybody whom they believed uh, somehow invaded their, their turf. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the Ku Klux Klan is believed the Klan between 1866 and 1872 killed about 5,000 people in the South. And uh, Congress actually held uh, sessions <coughs> to, uh, to deal with, 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 the, with the KKK. And it was revealed in 1872 that actually it's about the time that the Klan was, was dying in the South, that this, uh, uh, this session revealed that approximately 5,000 people had been, had been killed. Uh, it was a terror organization. And uh, Congress eventually would be uh, bent on destroying the Ku Klux Klan. And for the most part, as we shall see by 1875, the KKK uh, was slowly dying. But this is a mask uh, from the reconstruction uh, era. So we come to the impeachment of uh, President Johnson. This is, uh, this is in 1868. The House of Representatives drew up 11 articles of impeachment against uh, Mr. Johnson on uh, February 24th, 1868. All were related to his violation of the Tenure of Office Act by firing Edward M. Sand, Secretary of War. As, as Scott brought up, you know, they, they understood. They understood that this man hated Edward M. Stanton so badly that indeed they would, uh, that he would fire him. And so he really absolutely fell into their hands. Uh, also on trial in reality was his record on reconstruction. Uh, some people said it was really a farce. Yeah. There, there should never have been this impeachment of Mr. Johnson. Uh, they, they actually, as we just said, you, you know, paved the way for his uh, impeachment. But his veto of the Freedmen's Bureau Act back in 1866, we talked about the Freedmen's Bureau uh, the last time. Uh, when it was established back in March of 1865, it was given a one-year life. That is, within a year, hopefully, uh, the conditions of both blacks and whites in the South 
would be at a point where you would no longer need the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, but, he, uh, but, but Congress in, in February of 1866 saw the need to grant new life to the Freedmen's Bureau, and Mr. Johnson vetoed it. And the reason he vetoed it was because of the same kind of language that's being used today. It will make people lazy. That's why you cannot extend unemployment. <laughs> because it will make people lazy and wards of the state. And this is what he said in 1866. Uh, you will, you will uh, allow, you will force these people into positions where they will be wards of the state, that they will be dependents. So you see the parallels between yesterday uh, and today when you look at history. And of course, the fact that he vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and he vetoed all of the Reconstruction Acts, all four of them that were passed in March and July of 1867. So the showdown really continued. Uh, the trial. The trial actually began in, uh, in March of 1868 and lasted for about two months. Uh, the Supreme Court Justice, Simon Chase in this case, or the, whoever the Supreme Court Justice is, uh, Chief Justice, actually presides over the case. Uh, the articles of impeachment are drawn up by uh, a committee, the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives, and then it goes to the full House. The House votes on it. In this case, the House voted affirmatively. And then it goes to the United States Senate. The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court it presides over it. And you have these arguments back and forth, just like you might be in a court of law. And for two months, they, they went uh, at it back and forth. And in the final analysis, uh, they only voted on about three of these, and all three came back with a with similar vote. And this last vote was 35 to 19. He need, they needed 36. So actually, Johnson missed, uh, missed being convicted of high crimes and misdemeanors by that one vote. Uh, who would have succeeded Johnson if he had been uh, uh, convicted? Because he then waited until after a while. Why? He would be Senate pro tem, is that correct? Yeah. And there was no sitting vice president because they didn't do that. They didn't automatically right. reappoint him back then, right? So, right. So, uh, so, but I had heard that somebody didn't like him, and that's right. why they voted to not remove Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know which senator that was? That like Hayden Wade said, I don't want him. To I know there were there was some. You had about seven Republicans to come over to the Democrat side. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure exactly which it was, yeah. but uh, one vote that was actually removed. How many other U.S. presidents have been impeached? One. Who was that? He wasn't impeached. He wasn't impeached. He wasn't impeached. He wasn't impeached. Right, this, here it is, Joanne. They fussing back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nixon was impeached and not, but he resigned. Right. Before he the Senate was done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Zero. 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 Well, you actually have one. No question about it. I remember very well. Of course, if if uh, the full House had voted, eleven articles of impeachment were drawn up for Mr. Nixon, but it didn't even reach the full House. They didn't vote on it. He resigned, right. and uh, of course, his vice president had already resigned. Right? Yeah. Who was that? Right. And so Mr. Nixon uh, pulled in. Bill Ford cracked a deal, it is believed. 
The next major piece of legislation uh, that was passed by the U.S. Congress was the 15th Amendment. And the reason they, they wanted to pass this amendment was for the same reason. You, you need to put it in the Constitution. Any, we know what was happening at the state level. All kinds of deterrents to black voting were put in place by the southern states. So the federal government felt that you needed uh, an amendment that would be a part of the Constitution. And all of us know that even though you have an amendment, it surely doesn't mean that people are going to abide by the law. But uh, this uh, piece of legislation went up in 1869 and, and it became, and it was ratified in 18. Uh, probably all of this legislation is very important, but when you when you begin looking at you know our our process, uh, the way we do things in the United States, these freedoms that we uh, supposedly have, they're really tied to voting, because every decision that is made regarding you happens with a group of politicians, be it at the municipal level, city of Durham, be it at the county level, Durham County, be it at the state level, Raleigh, North Carolina, or Washington. Just about everything that we do happens in some room with a group of politicians. And, and when I hear people say, they don't do no green, need to vote no way, they're going to do what they want to do anyway, yeah. If, if you put a group of people there, and depending on the mix, will dictate exactly what they will do. So that's why it's, it's important that you, that you put people there whom you believe will best represent your... <laughs> You know, those things that you desire to, to be healthy for the nation, for the state, for the county, for your local area, for your community. And uh, that's across the board. For example, there may be some people who say, my best interest would be that certain groups in the community not have a right to vote. That's my best interest. Well, we hope that your best interest will not be served. So we're going to fight to ensure that somebody goes to Washington, to Raleigh, to Durham, to wherever, uh, who does not adhere to your philosophy of what is best for your community, for your state, or for the nation. So that's, that's what it's all about. It's a, it's a game that we play to essentially you know, get the kinds of things that we, uh, we want. Women not considered citizens? No. Citizens are not citizens. Uh -huh. No. They don't have the right to vote. And by the time, th you know, the other things going on in 1869, 1870, when this is being debated, all white women across the country were really upset. They have the right to be. Because what they were saying is if you're going to give individuals who were in slavery just four or five years ago the right to vote, and I'm your wife, I'm your daughter. But, I, but it's a citizen. I mean, so is this basically saying that a woman wasn't a citizen? You're exactly right. <laughs> yes. It's my dream, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I never thought of that. Oh, oh did y'all think that you were citizens of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago? I mean, it's only been a few years that you can get anything in your name. Right? Yeah. If you wanted a loan a few decades ago, you couldn't have got it, gotten it in your name. I thought we were clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a good question, though. Yeah. I mean, when, when you stop and think about it, really? when you stop and think about it, you know, what, what was it that, uh, who, was the first, who was the second president of the United States? Uh, John Adams. Uh, what did his wife say to him? 
Right. Were they considered? Consider the ladies. Were they considered? I mean, when when did the right to vote come? 19th Amendment. So you're talking about the 15th Amendment here for, and, and it was it was very very political, obviously. I mean, they you know, folks are not doing doing things just out of the goodness of their heart and this deep abiding love that I have for the ex slaves. Uh, there were some political motives involved. I mean, the bottom line is that everybody knew that if blacks were given the right to vote, who they would vote for. They would vote for the individual they had been told freed them. And so the Republican Party is seizing on that. They are doing everything in their powers to make sure that they are reelected and so by giving the franchise to uh, male, black males, 21 years of age and older, they knew that they would be able to continue to be successful. And it worked. It worked. As a matter of fact, it, you have, uh, even in the post-Reconstruction era, even when it was really bad, you still had blacks in North Carolina going to the House of Representatives in Washington because of the black vote in those 16 counties in the eastern part of, the, of North Carolina, the second congressional district. So folks understood the power of giving the franchise to uh, blacks. <coughs> That's it. I saw a hand in the back. Let me go. Okay. And then of course, uh, the, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, didn't say anything about gender, didn't say sex, did it? And, and the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Okay. That second section is very important, really important, and we'll talk about it a little later on. Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you have this legislation being passed by Congress. Freedmen's Bureau to help transition the slaves from slavery to freedom, but the Freedmen's Bureau is also designed to help those white refugees and the fact that people were doing bad as a result of the war. So you have that, you have the 13th Amendment, which actually legally brings slavery to an end in the U.S. And now you want to make the former slaves, citizens of the United States with the 14th, with the Civil Rights Bill and the 14th Amendment. And now you have the 15th Amendment uh, being passed and ratified in 1870. But what we saw in 1870 was complete defiance. 1871, because of the passage of the 15th Amendment, it appears that the KKK just went on a rampage to ensure the blacks did not get this right to vote in the 1870 election and thereafter. And so what they're, what they're doing is absolutely killing individuals whom we call, we don't like to use that term, scalawags and carpetbaggers and all of those individuals who may have been voting the Republican ticket. Uh, people are absolutely being lynched, white and black. People are being run out of their homes Folks are, are absolute, uh, whole uh, uh, communities are being burned. There are race riots across the South, one in, in, in Memphis, Tennessee, one in New Orleans, where dozens of, of people uh, are being killed. And so it's an ugly time in the, in the U.S., uh, in the South. And so Mr. Grant, who uh, is now the, the, uh, the President of the United States, decided that it was time to destroy the Ku Klux Klan. And this is the terminology that he actually used. It's time to destroy the KKK. So he told Congress to send me a bill that does that. And so what we have is something that we don't refer to today, but in 1870, Congress called it the Civil Rights Bill of 1870. 
and the Civil Rights Bill of 1871. So the first Civil Rights Bill was in 1866. Now you have one in 1870 and another one in 1871 to put a cap on the one that's passed in 1870. All right? Commonly, they are referred to as the Enforcement Act of 1870 and 1871, or the Ku Klux Klan Acts, or the simply the Force Acts of 1870 and 71. And how did Congress go about trying to destroy the Ku Klux Klan? The law in 1870, that it shall be the duty of every person and officer to give to all citizens of the United States the same and equal opportunity to perform any prerequisite and to become qualified to vote without distinction of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And if any person or officer shall refuse unknowingly omit to give full effect to this section, he shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and shall on conviction thereof be fined not less than $500 or be imprisoned not less than one month and not more than one year or both at discretion of the court. Right? Now, other sections, if you, if you read the, the 1870 law, you will, you will see that, that other sections uh, even made the, uh, the penalties uh, stiffer. $5,000 fine and up to 10 years in prison at discretion of the court. Now, the one passed in 1871, because the one in 1870 was not being adhered to, they are actually taking any act that you performed against a former slave as a federal crime. So now they are now federalizing any crime that is committed against individuals who are trying to exercise their right to vote. I mean, you, if you read it, you can see just how, uh, how angry, you know, if you look at all sections, I don't have all sections of the 1875, there are about seven or eight sections. You can see the, the kind of the anger of some of the, uh, the language in this document. Uh, under the Act of 1871, the president was given the authority to send troops into areas where violence against the former slaves were most prevalent. Criminal acts were considered federal crimes. This was an act of rebellion against the United States. And that, those are the words of President Ulysses S. Grant. That you, you are actually committing a rebellion, which, which means that you're committing treason against the United States. And that's how we're going to get the Ku Klux Klan. This was an act of rebellion. For example, martial law was declared in several South Carolina counties in 1872, and it led to the arrest and conviction of hundreds of Klansmen. It, it absolutely scared the KKK to death, at least in South Carolina. Many of them actually left the state of South Carolina. Many ran to the woods. Many just said, I'm no longer associated with the KKK. If I'm going to do something, I'm just going to do it on my own uh, and not put a hood on. I don't want to be associated with this terror organization. Uh, and, and troops, uh, Alamance County, North Carolina, for example, in 1870, 71, 72, uh, not quite as bad as some of the counties in, in South Carolina and Georgia, but they were pretty, pretty rowdy. In, uh, in Alamance County. Uh, let me just take time to read section three because this is the point at, at which it becomes, you know, this federal crime. And the word insurrection is used. That in all cases where insurrection, domestic violence, unlawful combinations, or conspiracies in any state shall so obstruct or hinder the execution of the laws thereof and of the United States as to deprive any portion or class of the people of such state of any of the rights, privileges, or immunities, or protection, naming the Constitution, they go on and on and on, and we go on and we go on, and or comment. any person who shall be arrested under the provisions of this and the preceding section shall be delivered to the marshal 
of the proper district to be dealt with according to law. So the federal government, with those troops there, and, and as a matter of fact, down in South Carolina, uh, to, to really show how the federal government, uh, to show its intervention and powers, when it came time for some of those, form, those Ku Klux Ku Klux Klan members to be tried, they were tried before all black jurors. Yeah. And of course, they were, they were impartial. <laughs> Another section of the 1871 uh, Enforcement Act suspended the writ of habeas corpus guaranteed to U.S. citizens in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2 of the U.S. Constitution. The writ of habeas corpus. In layman's terms, what is the writ of habeas corpus? Scott? Your right to a day in court. Your right to a day in court. Habeas corpus, huh? Hopefully. Uh, it literally means the body. Bring the body before the court. Corpus. Right. The, uh, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion uh, the public safety may require it. That's Article uh, 1, Section 9, Clause 2. So, in other words, the President of the United States can suspend the writ of habeas corpus, and he used it one time. He used it in South Carolina in late 1871, which meant that it don't make any difference if you say you didn't do it. If we deem that you are a terrorist, it don't make any difference at all. We don't, we don't have, huh? Sort of like John Tyler. Exactly, exactly. Basically, a real papers corpus is a judicial mandate requiring that a prisoner be brought before the court to determine whether the government has the right to continue detaining them. And in three instances in the history of the United States, the writ of habeas corpus has been suspended. Mr. Lincoln did so in 1861, and then you understand why he did it, beginning of the <laughs> Civil War. It was done again in 1871, and then in your own lifetime, 2006 it was done. Was an outcry, was there an outcry on your part to say you should be ashamed of yourself, Mr. Bush? <laughs> Actually, uh, under the Military Commissions Act of, eight, of 2006, yeah, there was tremendous uh, outcry on the part of, of people to say, you know, you should not do this. Uh, but you know, those unlawful enemy combatants and all of this is, was a result of, you know, 9-11. Yeah. Now, are we still under? Has, has the writ of habeas corpus still suspended? I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Yeah, usually it's just a few, well, yeah, normally. And in 1861, of course, it ended in 1865. In 1871, it ended in 1875. So, yeah, that, that's a I'm not sure. I need to check on that and see if it's still in, in effect. I doubt it, though. All right. Well, the significance of the Enforcement Act, believe it or not, is that it really slowed down the KKK. As a matter of fact, what we know of as the official Ku Klux Klan pretty much died in 1872. The Knights of White Camellia that was established in 1866, and whereas the KKK uh, had uh, a basic membership of poor people, the Knights of White Familia was actually an organization of uh, middle class people, doctors and lawyers and theologians.
theologians and ministers and, and uh, businessmen, merchants, and so forth. Uh, most of the people said, you're not violent enough, so it, it pretty much died. And uh, many of those individuals actually joined uh, the Ku Klux Klan. But the KKK pretty much died, and so through, this 18, uh, through the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s, you don't hear very much about Ku Klux Klan. I mean, people are, people are doing their own thing against people and not allowing them to vote. But in terms of an organized system, uh, at least you don't have the KKK. And when it, it did resurface, where do you see it? Indiana. Indiana. In the north, around Chicago, and they have another group of uh, they have other targets now: you know, Catholics, and Jews, Chinese, and that type of those individuals. As as we look at the legislation that was passed, we, we starting again with the Freedmen's Bureau, Thirteenth Amendment, Civil Rights Bill of eighteen sixty six. You've given people the right to vote in 1870. You've, you've slowed the Ku Klux Klan down so folks could exercise that right to vote. Beginning in 1870, Charles Sumner, who was a senator from Massachusetts, who had actually been caned by Preston Brooks back in 1856 and was out of Congress for, for a number of years, made it back. And what he wanted to do was to ensure now that uh, th the former slaves had access to public accommodations. So, so you, you, you can vote, but you can't go into a hotel. You can vote, but you can't go into this restaurant. You can vote, but you cannot ride on the train. Or if you ride on the train, it would be in a separate car, or you had to ride on the back of that particular car. Or if you went into a restaurant, you might have to go in the back door. Or if you're allowed to come in at all, it may be a partition between you and white uh, patrons. So Charles Sumner actually began this campaign as early as 1846. When it came time to, uh, for the NAACP to try to bring down the walls of segregation in public schools, they, in, in the 1940s and 50s, who did they look to? Charles Sumner, because he actually started doing this in Massachusetts as early as 1850. He filed suit, or took on a case of a little black girl who, like Brown, could not go to a school that was just a mile or two from her house. She had to go 15 miles around that school because she was black. Donald Franklin often talked about how he used Charles Sumner when he helped present a brief to the U.S. Supreme Court in the Brown decision. So Charles Sumner was a very important uh, figure in, in the Civil Rights Movement uh, and in Reconstruction. And, and, and he fought hard beginning in 1870, but was really not successful in getting legislation passed until 1875. He died in 1874. Uh, legislation had been passed in the House of Representatives before he died. And uh, because of his death, it was likely that the other branch, the other, the other House, went ahead and passed the, the Civil Rights Bill of 1875. But by the time it, it got to uh, its final passage, it had really been watered down. Now, the watering down had to do with education. Uh, in the bill, initially, was that blacks and whites would be going to school together. That, would, that, that any legislation passed by the southern states would be null and void. And any future legislation that separated blacks and whites uh, in, in the public schools would be uh, unlawful. So you know, they, they actually stripped that from but nevertheless, you, you have a bill here. And if you look at the preamble to the bill, 
Whereas it is essential to just government, we recognize the equality of all men before the law and hold that it is the duty of government and its dealings with the people to net out equal and exact justice to all of whatever nativity, race, color, or persuasion, religious or political, and it being the appropriate object of legislation to enact great fundamental principles into law. Therefore, be it, uh, be it enacted that all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States shall be entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of the accommodations, advantages, facilities, and privileges of inns, public conveyances on land or water, theaters, and other places of public amusement, subject only to the conditions and limitations established by law, and applicable alike to citizens of every race and color, regardless of any previous condition of servitude. That was the Civil Rights Bill of 1875. Sounds like something that may have been passed in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. This is 1875. Uh, blacks across the country assailed it as one of the best things that could have happened. Uh, progressive whites said that it's time. And, and even what happens, of course, what happened was that even some of those who passed the legislation or who voted to pass did it reluctantly because they understood that it would be a showdown. Uh, they understood that, that, that uh, Southerners were going to rebel against this. And they were, they were right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, attorney, attorney generals across the country did not enforce it. Uh, judges did not enforce it. So obviously, uh, blacks are, are going to begin exercising their right under the law. So they began to go into those restaurants and they're told you can't come in. They get on a train and they say that you cannot ride in this car. There's another car reserved for you. You went into a, a hotel or into an inn, or to a, a theater, or, or to the New York Opera House. And this is not just a Southern phenomenon. This is in California. It's in Indiana. It's in Ohio. It's in New Jersey. It's in Boston. It's all across the South, uh, all across the nation. Uh, people are being denied, were, were being denied this. And, and the thing about it, you must understand that Northerners were passing this kind of legislation. When I say this kind of legislation, I'm talking about legislation barring blacks from entering restaurants and hotels and motels, you know, 50, 60 years prior to the end of the Civil War. Southerners learned how to write this legislation based on reading what Northerners had written. Right. So during slavery times, you may have had your drivers in terms of being a slave or being in New York or in Boston, but it didn't mean that you were uh, you living this pristine, beautiful life. Is there any history of civil disobedience in this late 1800s era? You know, we kind of think that that's something that didn't happen until our own civil rights era here. <laughs> was there, is there a history of that? Uh, there was not a lot of uh, civil disobedience at this point, say between 1875 and, and, and 1880, 82. It's going to come along a little later on. You do have race riots that are, that are occurring, but for the most part, people believe the best way to handle the situation was through the courts and through the legislative process. So you're not going to have that kind of uh, defiance by the, on the part of black and white. This time, but it's going to come a little later on. But what what you see is that individuals are filing suit against the states and against private the private sector after 1875, all over the place. In just about every state in the union, there are suits, and uh, they uh, 
the United States Supreme Court had decided that they were not going to look at these cases. They had decided that they were not going to look at these cases. There were nine members of the U.S. Supreme Court. All of eight of them were from, from non-Southern states. There was only one individual from a Southern state on the U.S. Supreme Court. And that was uh, John Marshall Holland from Kentucky. Well, Kentucky was a state in the Union, although it had Southern sympathizers. It was a state in the Union. It was Kentucky during the Civil War was not part of the Confederacy. No, it was a border state. state. Yeah, border state. Yeah. Well, a as it turns out, uh, many of these cases uh, started coming in. And, and the big thing is, can we get enough money to bring these cases before the courts? And as it turns out, a lot of people are trying. Uh, eventually, the US Supreme Court decided that they would listen to some of these cases. About five cases went before the US Supreme Court. And in October 1883, the court ruled on the constitutionality of the Civil Rights Bill of 1875, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. Now, one of the cases that came before the courts involved a, a black 26-year-old man in New York by the name of William R. Davis. Davis was described in the press as a very handsome, uh, fair complexion black man. It was, he was discernible. You knew that he was black. He and his girlfriend, who was an octoroon, who was very, very fair complexion, went to the New York Opera House for a 1.30 performance to see John Wilkes Booth's brother perform. As it turns out, they went to the, to the doorman uh, to present the tickets, and the doorman said, I'm sorry, these tickets are no good. So Davis said, she purchased these tickets. You know, the doorman thought that his girlfriend was a white woman. He said, she purchased these tickets. You know they got to be all right. He said, uh, I'm sorry, but you can't come in. So what Davis did was to, to leave, and he gave some money to a 17-year-old white boy to go back up to the doorman and purchase more tickets. He purchased the tickets, brought them back to Davis. Davis went to the counter again, and the man said, I'm sorry, these tickets are no good. She can come in, but you can't. So Davis, is, Davis filed suit and his was one of the five suits that went before the US Supreme Court. Another case involved a black man and a woman who was also of fair complexion who boarded a train. And the black man, uh, the porter told him that he would have to go into a separate car, that he should not be doing this with this woman because he believed that she was, she was white. Uh, so in both cases, it was an attempt on the part of these individuals to kind of protect you know, the sanctity of, of white womanhood, they believe, you know, that these, they're with these, these black men and perhaps they're taking advantage of them or something. But October 1883, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a decision. The court ruled that the 1875 Civil Rights Bill was unconstitutional. In a vote of seven to one, one member of the court was not there to the vote. In a vote of seven to, one, seven to one, the court ruled that it was unconstitutional. The majority decision, the court determined that the amendment prohibited only official state-sponsored discrimination and could not reach discrimination practiced by privately owned <coughs> places of public accommodation. In other words, Actually, the court said many things. This is kind of a summary. But the court said that, that the federal government had gone beyond their purview in passing this kind of legislation. 
that it was a violation of states' rights to pass this kind of legislation. Well, the, the big question is, well, what about all the other legislation that's been passed? It, would that also not be, would that not, would that not be a violation of states' rights? Well, the court said in 1883, it's a violation of states' rights. And beyond that, when a person goes into a restaurant, a hotel, it is not the state that is in violation of that person's right. It is that particular entity. And so what they're doing, is, remember I, I, I talked about the 14th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment has a clause that says what? No state may abridge the rights, privileges, immunities. So the court found a loophole in the word what? State. So if you walked into a restaurant and you were not given service and you sued, it was not the state of North Carolina that in some way impeded that, your right, stood in the way of you exercising your right. It was Woolworths. <laughs> it was Sears. It was, you know, the proprietor. You're going to sue anybody, sue the proprietor. But it is not a violation of the 14th Amendment. So the, the civil rights, be, if you did anything that you wanted to in terms of not abiding by the Civil Rights Bill of 1875, it was not a violation of the 14th Amendment. It was not a violation of, of that law. Right. Also, the court said in, in, in October of 1883 that because cases were coming before them in terms of the blacks not being allowed to exercise their right to vote, the court said the 15th Amendment does give the former slaves the right to vote, but it does not give them the right not to be discriminated against when they go to the polls to vote. <laughs> right? So as a result of this ruling, what do you have? An explosion of legislation across the South that really blocked to, uh, the former slaves from voting. You have the grandfather clause passed by Mississippi in 1890. North Carolina passed its version of the grandfather clause in 1897. Literacy tests, good moral character <laughs> references, poll tax. So you take a, a, a county uh, just hypothetically where in 1890 you may have had 10,000 <laughs> eligible black voters by 1900, you only had 100. It was that, that kind of thing across the South. Yes, sir. So the, no, the concept of states' rights, was that the first time it was asserted after the Civil War as a legal, legitimate legal doctrine? Mm, good question. Did I think about it? Well, he said after the Civil War. OK. I think, oh, yeah. I think when we got that, that language got started. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, you can, you can go back to uh, 1798. Was no, but I am asking about after. after yeah. yeah to, to the best of my knowledge, yeah, I have to check it, but probably so. Probably so. Uh, because it, it really, 1883 becomes the first United States Supreme Court that deals with this whole issue of state rights. So I'll say yes. Because yeah. before it was sort of part of insurrection or something. Exactly. Right. But uh, 1883 probably would be the first time after 1865 that you have this whole states' rights issue. The dissenting opinion, Justice John Marshall Holland, he is the dissenting judge. He's also the dissenting judge 13 years later in Plessy versus Ferguson. And to read that entire decision is like reading something in the 21st century, you know, to read uh, Justice Holland's opinion. Uh, Holland, uh, in his dissent, argued that segregation in public accommodations was a badge of slavery, and that the act could be constitutionally justified by looking to the 13th Amendment. 
This amendment gave Congress the authority to outlaw all badness and incidents to slavery, and Holland believed that if you didn't give somebody the right to vote, that was a badge of slavery. That was just his, his belief. Holland pointed out that, that before the Civil War, the Supreme Court protected the rights of slaveholders. Less than 20 years after slavery, the court refused to extend its power and authority to protect the former slaves. Uh, and he becomes this, this lone dissenter. And, and by the way, he's a southerner. But by this time, he uh, had asked for forgiveness. Uh, his family was a uh, long time, uh, you know, many generations of, of owning slaves. And uh, he had gotten to a point where he believed that uh, all people were equal before the law and their God. And uh, becomes this, uh, he's known as the great dissenter. Because not only did he, um, dissent with regard to legislation affecting blacks. He also dissented and said that the United States absolutely had no business engaging in uh, kingdom building outside the United States. He absolutely believed that it was wrong for the U.S. to uh, adopt what they called protectorate common word for them, for their forces, colonies. Mm -hmm. and so he was against the United States going into Hawaii. Uh, he was against uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, taking after the Spanish-American War, Cuba, Who Puerto appointed Rico. him? Who appointed him as president? I'm not sure. Was it? Oh, that little paper on some of your classes, that's why I know. Mm -hmm. Lester Hayes. Mm -hmm. Hayes. Uh, he wrote a paper for me, but I didn't read the paper, so I didn't know. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but, uh, okay. All right. So we have uh, we've gone through the legislation, uh, very, very important legislation from 1865 all the way down to 1883, 18 years of this. Uh, but that wasn't the only thing going on in the country. America was about the business of becoming this uh, world power with regard to economics. John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and Jay Gould. And, you know, so there are a lot of things going on, inventions, more inventions between 1865 and 1900 and all the previous years combined. Between 1865 and 1900, 15 immigrants coming into the United States. So, you know, it's a, sometimes you almost have to simplify a very, very complex set of uh, events to understand, mm -hmm. you know, a part of it. Yeah. But all of this stuff was so inextricably tied together. You know, it wasn't happening in isolation. You can't talk about one part of American history without understanding how it is so related to aspect, other aspects of American history. But you know, your mind would be completely jumbled if you tried to put all of this stuff into an hour and a half. So today is Reconstruction. <laughs> another day it might be something else. It, it could be John D. Rockefeller. Uh, another time it could be E.C. Knight versus the United States. And, and look at what was happening in Durham at the same time. Uh, Durham is, is on its way to becoming uh, a major economic power at the same time that Reconstruction is going on in the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s. Uh, you have a tremendous cooperation between blacks and whites by the 1890s and the turn of the 20th century uh, over the, the issue of economics. Uh, in terms of social and political equality, you know, we're not gonna deal with that. <laughs> but uh, Booker T. Washington uh, said it best uh, when he spoke in 1895 down in uh, Atlanta at the Atlanta Cotton Exposition Washington was the first black man to be invited to speak at the exposition, pretty much like our fair that we have every year in October. And uh, uh, Washington uh, raised his hands and said, you know, in all things which are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, <laughs> but one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. So we're not trying to date your, your, your girls. We're not trying to be a part of your political system 
all we want is to make it economical we want cooperation between you know you and ourselves uh, so that the south can do well and uh, he instantly becomes the leader the black leader in the south and uh, at some point in time we might talk about Plessy versus Ferguson but the Plessy versus Ferguson decision may may not have been rendered and not he said in all things such a truth social we can be as separate as the fingers yet, one is the hand. So without a doubt, those nine justices up, uh, uh, up in Washington heard Booker T. Washington. He becomes the mouthpiece. He is the national spokesman for black Americans until his death in 1915. And that very, very powerful speech allowed him to be the first black man to actually come to the White House, you know, not as a custodian, <laughs> <laughs> he goes there and he eats and he has dinner. He has dinner. And, it was an, and of course, people across the country were completely outraged. So much so that they suppressed it. No, it wasn't dinner, it was lunch. Snacks. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, no, it was not. It was not lunch. It was really kind of like it was snack. Really, <laughs> anything to, anything to have him sitting around the table with Mrs. Roosevelt, sitting at the table with Mrs. Roosevelt, first lady of the United States, the black man. That was something that you could not do. So Didn't the governor of South Carolina, I want to say his name was Tillman said, we're going to have to now hang a thousand people, put them back in their place. Yeah, Ben Pitchfork Tillman, they call him. <laughs> sure did. We won't talk about what, uh, what some other people said, too. Yeah. We have time for a few questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, you, you know, it really depends on the doorman and his idea about race. Uh, you know, he, uh, if it had been an, uh, uh, two black people, probably he, he would allow them to come on in. Uh, because there were no laws in, in New York that disallowed blacks to go to the opera. And blacks have been going to the opera for, for decades. Uh, so this was a, a personal thing. That's what it was. <laughs> exactly. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Um, at the sort of at the beginning when you were talking about the military districts. The, the mil five military districts. Right. Yes. And then the states came back in, and you said that seven states came back in on a, on a certain day, but some of the states didn't come back in. Like Texas didn't come back in. That was not part, not part the same of time, but they. All of them were back in by 1870. North Carolina was actually, it said 1868, but they, they were kicked out again. Actually, North Carolina did not come back in until 1870. Uh, you don't get redemption in North Carolina until about 1870. Uh, but by, by 1871, 1872, all the states were, had come back into the Union, and their delegates were seated in Washington. Okay. Okay. Does that answer the question? Well, it, it seems like the um, it seems like the two um, s the slides didn't e didn't equal when they talked about the I think the five districts there were ten states and then there was a, the next slide or something talked about the states that did come back in and there were only seven states at that time so it wasn't all the states that were under the military. Um, the yeah, ten states were under the military act, but they came back in at different times. Okay, so yeah. so the example you gave was a particular time when there were seven right, states. Right, exactly. Okay, right. Thank now you. Some of them uh, have been, like North Carolina, 
even though it came in between the 22nd and the 25th, um, uh, actually North Carolina was kicked out of game and they didn't come back in until 1870. My question is, was the martial law then lifted from the states that rejoined the Union? Because you mentioned that that went on af from after the Civil War to like 77. No, all the states continue to be under martial law. Well, then I have another question. Then, when they were having all the riots and you said, okay, they, they, they sent more troops to South Carolina and put it under martial law. Well, it was still under martial law, wasn't it? Yeah, it was under martial law. Were they not enforcing it? Well, if you, if you left it up to the states, reason that they had to actually send those troops in was because the local people would not make sure that people were not turned in for violating people's rights. You know, so they, they needed a little more muscle. Mm -hmm. Oh, they needed more, yeah, more muscle. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The uh, last one I want to let everybody pull on my side. When the blacks were allowed to go to restaurants, this is like the 1870s. Mm -hmm. What was the economic condition of them? Were they actually able to afford to go on the train trips? Okay. Where, where was the money at that point coming from? Well, you, you, well, depending on what you're talking about, I mean, if you lived in New York, you lived in New Jersey, you lived in California, you were working, uh, you have people who are actually going across the country on, on train rides. Uh, by 1869, 1870, you know, the Transcontinental Railroad had been finished and, and people are, are going on these excursions or they're going from town to town. They had money. Uh, you you have, to, have to remember that um, there was always a free black population before slavery ended that had capital, they had businesses, uh, and, and even the former slaves uh, actually worked. For example, William Davis, uh, the guy I talked about, uh, he was actually born a slave. but but. But he, he's in New York. He's born in South Carolina, but he's in New York. Uh, you know, by eighteen, uh, by, by eighteen, this happened in eighteen seventy nine. He was born in eighteen fifty three. So in eighteen seventy nine, he's in New York, and he is actually the editor of a newspaper in New York. So yeah, folks are, are making some money, so they can go into restaurants, they can go into hotels, they're they're purchasing land. Okay, well, one more. We'll just, no, we haven't let her. We gotta let Mr. Clinton. Yes. When the riots in uh, Memphis was? 1866. 1866. That uh, was when they burned day. down Lemoyne College. Was when? Was that when they bur burned down? They sure did. Mm -hmm. It was 1866, and, uh, and it was in Memphis, Tennessee. I know. My right. grandmother was in Lemoyne at that time. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What and that's 18 what now tell 1866. me 1866 thank you yeah okay. what did they burn down they burned down the uh the college lemoyne yes. college it was an all-black college lemoyne l-e -E, capital m-o-y-n-e lemoyne college let's give dr parker a big hand thank you so much our next class will be march the 16th we'll see you all then thank you for coming